what I do is that I help people heal from the wounds that conditional love left in their lives. Hi, I'm Brilliant, your host for this show. I know that I'm incredibly blessed. As the son of self-made billionaires, I've seen the high price some people pay for success, and I've learned that money really can't buy happiness. But I've also had the good fortune to learn directly from many of the world's leading teachers. If you are ready to be, do, have, and give more, this podcast is for you. If you are interested in learning to love unconditionally, I think you'll be interested in the conversation I have today with my guest, Don Miguel Ruiz Jr. He's the author of five books. His most recent is The Seven Secrets to Healthy, Happy Relationships. We talk about what it means to live as an artist and the Toltec tradition. We talk about something called domestication, where we have ideas of who we should be and how we should live and what happens when we don't live up to those. We talk about how we can heal from a lifetime of conditional love. We talk about what love is. We talk about how change happens, what a moment of clarity is, what to do when you're blessed with one. We talk about the difference between guilt and remorse, the difference between an apology and forgiveness. But we also talk about the ego, what it is, how it operates, how you can understand it better to live a happier life. You can learn more about Don Miguel Ruiz Jr. at his website, which is miguelruizjr.com. I hope you enjoy this conversation with my new friend, Don Miguel Ruiz Jr. Don Miguel, welcome to the School for Good Living. Thank you, Brilliance. Thank you for having me on your program. Will you tell me, please, what is life about? Ooh. It always changes for me at the moments to enjoy it, to engage the people I love, to create the things I enjoy doing. So you can say it's to enjoy. That's my current point of view of it. But it's always changing, you know. And when I was a kid, it was play. When I was a teenager, it was to expand. When I was in my 20s, it was to find that strength. You know, it's like find my voice. And in my 30s, it was all about my kids. You know, it's, it's all about how to raise them. In my 40s, I'm like, it's to enjoy it, you know, because you realize how quick everything is flowing. So it's the things that is, to me, it's the moment where I stop taking for granted the people I love and the times I have with them. So it's to enjoy, you know, enjoy these moments, enjoy my youth, enjoy my wife, enjoy my kids, my, enjoy my parents the way they are right now. You know, I've lost people whom I love very much, uh, not just to the pandemic, but with life, you know, I'm, I'm, the loss of my mama Gaia, my grandparents. And it's the things when you realize that life has all the right to say no to you, but enjoy it when life is saying yes. And that includes spending time with people we love, spending time doing what we love to do, working creating, enjoying, uh, playing. It's, it's, you can say, in other words, to be present. Yes. Yeah, beautiful response to that question. Thank you for sharing. In that response, you mentioned your grandmother. And I understand that your grandmother, Madre Sarita, was someone who was very special in your life. Will you tell me about who she is, who she was, and what roles she's had, what impact she's had in your life? Sure. Well, my grandma Sarita, abuelita Sarita, or madre Sarita, um, she is the spiritual head of this family, even though she passed away 13 years ago uh, in 2008. She was 98 years old, but she is that fire that gave life literally to this whole family. And uh, you can say she is the line in the lineage, the, the moment in time where the tradition was no longer just focused on the family, it just was internal. She's the one who decided to share it with everyone. Mm. So you can say that it is her that whom's footsteps we're following. You know, people say sometimes I'm following my father's footsteps, Don Miguel Ruiz, but that's incorrect. My father, myself, my brother Jose Ruiz are continuing what my grandma Sarita started, which is to share the tradition with a whole community. Now, that tradition being is the Toltec tradition. 
my brother, my grandmother was born in 1910 in a small little town called Juanacatlan, Jalisco, in Mexico. You can imagine that traditional Mexican small town with all the big hats and, you know, the kind of you see in movies. That's the kind of town she grew up in. And 1910, that's the Mexican Revolution. So her childhood was shaped by that uh, Mexican Revolution and all the going on about that. Then came the, her, the, her teens were the Roaring Twenties and 1930s. She had 13 children, my father being the 13th one. Wow. She's a very strong woman. She had to be. <laughs> very, very much so, you know. And um, one day, she, um, one of her youngest children, uh, sons, we mean, passed away in a car accident in Fresno, California. And for her, she got really upset and it affected her health. You know, the, the, that's what sometimes mourning does, you know, when you lose someone you love, especially as a mother. So her health was deteriorating and the family members, her sisters, all in her started giving her healing. They started practicing the tradition with her in that, uh, and you can say faith healing. My grandmother recovered. She had an experience that she couldn't explain in one of those sessions. Like she meditated, she had this moment, and she felt incredibly relieved. And she wanted to share that. That was the fire that made her share the tradition with everyone else. Gratitude. Mm-hmm. She was so grateful that she decided to share the tradition with everyone so at that point, she was already living in Tijuana and San Diego, California. And she opened up a temple called Nueva Vida in the 1970s. And there, that's when she started to teach our tradition to the whole community there of Barrio Logan, which is the Hispanic Mexican American community there in San Diego, the barrio. But little by little, people just came to see her because she was first speaking to the, to, the, to the neighborhood, but people came, people came to see her, came not just to listen to her lessons, because she would give uh, on Thursdays and Sundays sermons, you know, that, that's the translation. She would call it catedras in Spanish. Uh, I would translate that to sermons on Thursday and Sundays, but from Monday through Friday, she would do healings. And, People, not just from the community, went, but other people from the state of California came coming and also became national. They became international. People from all over the world came looking at her. And as she progressed and people got to know who she was, you know, there's this uh, newscast, uh, the local channel, the local NBC channel did a piece on her and talking about her ability to heal people who are she healed people who had cancer and all these other diseases. One of her uh, mo- most proud moments when she gave a lecture to a panel of doctors at UCSD back in the day, and she was the first woman to be hired by the state of California to practice her tradition with the community. So she worked at Casa Familiar in San Isidro. So she was a woman that had so much faith in life, in God, in herself that she just continued to help as many as she could. And she always said that she was just the instrument of life of God to help other people. In 2007, uh, the year before she passed away, she was inducted into the San Diego Women's Hall of Fame, where they were honoring her for maintaining a tradition. You know, they, they honored her ability. And the reason why that is, is because her father, Don Leonardo, and her grandfather, Don Ezequiel, um, they lived in Mexico, but there was still that taboo that, you know, after the conquest and the whole inquisition, that taboo that if you speak anything outside Catholicism in Mexico was pretty strong. You can say that's what drove them to just be secluded. You know, that's the, the, the history of the uh, colonialism of Mexico, of La Nueva España, or what left was left of it. Mm-hmm. But by the time Maria Sarita reached that age, everything had changed. You know, the 50s affected, the 60s affected, and she was in the right moment to be able to share that which she was able to share. And that's who my grandmother is. You know, a grandmother, of a, gra- a great-grandmother, a great-great-grandmother. There was six, when, when she passed away, there were six generations living. You know, wow. she, 
her first uh, baby, my tia Angelita, uh, was born when my abuelita Sarita was 15 years old. And she was about 42 when my father was born. So it's, you know, <laughs> she had a lot of work to do. But her passion, her joy, her love, her faith was pretty much impressive and did the best she could. So it was a beautiful thing to witness. Yeah, what a wonderful legacy to be a part of and to carry on. And what an incredible woman. And, and if I understand correctly, as you're saying that, her ability to heal and her faith and her love, it sounds like they were deepened and maybe developed from the grief and the loss that she experienced. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As, as you can say that we grieve because we love, if we didn't have love, we wouldn't grieve. So from that point of view, her ability to share came from love and that's what she did. Wow. Yeah. And uh, what's the saying about, you know, pain or trials can make us bitter or better. And it sounds like in her case, she definitely chose better and not everyone does. Mm -hmm. What, what an amazing teacher. Um, you mentioned in, in your sharing there about the Toltec tradition, will you share mm -hmm. with me what, a little bit more about it? What, what is it and how can we maybe understand it or even participate in it in a way that could improve the quality of our lives? Well, sure. Um, the word Toltec is a Nahuatl word that means artist in English. If I translate the phrase, the Toltec art of transformation into 100% English, it means the artist path of transformation. Mm -hmm. I am an artist and the work of art that I create is my life. You can say life is the canvas by which I create that work of art. And the instrument I'm going to use to create that work of art, is going to be this body. It's going to be this mind. It's kind of like my will, my intent, my yes and my no. So with that, you can say that this canvas is con continuously changing with every choice that I make. I can create the most harmonious dream or the most perfect nightmare, depending on how I am and engaging. So you can say that I am a Toltec means that I am an artist that creates a work of art that is my life. And... You can say that historically, you know, there's a culture in Mexico that was called the Toltecs that existed over 500 years ago. And it, it was basically, according to oral tradition, the people who created Teotihuacan, that's the oral tradition. But as a culture, they created Tula and many other little cities across El Valle de Mexico. Um, and you can say that they thrive as a beautiful culture, but they cease to exist either with the expansion of the Aztec Empire or the Spanish Empire. So when that ceased to exist, it became an oral tradition. Mm -hmm. So there's families in Mexico that teach it the way they taught it over 500 years ago. And there's people like my family who adapts it with each generation. Uh, my grandmother used to say to us, if you practice the Totec tradition the way I or your father practice it, you're killing the tradition because all you're doing is repeating it verbatim. To apply the tradition is to apply all the lessons that you've learned in life. And the consequences of those actions is what becomes and teaches you in life. It's the thing that teaches you not just what a sermon or a lecture gives you, but the practice, practicality of the consequences that impacts your life. So life is the teacher. Wow. So from that point of view, you know, depending on the family, depending on where you come from, there's definitely, we know people who practice it as it was 500 years ago. Then we have the families like mine that adapted. I'm speaking to you in English, so I'm already adapting it as we sure. should, just by that action alone. Yeah. And we're doing that's, it through technology, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that's, that's the history of it. How does it benefit us? Well, it's, uh, my brother likes to say this, this quote, in the Toltec tradition, there's nothing to learn but to unlearn. Mm -hmm. And what we're unlearning is the thing that prevents us from living the life we want to live, you know, by letting go of conditional love or domesticated point of views. So from that point of view, what I do is that I help people heal from the wounds that conditional love left in their lives. Mm -hmm. You will never be out of work. 
<laughs> I don't think. Um, I want to acknowledge too this, um, I think, not sure what to call it, wisdom, generosity of, you know, that I'm hearing in your, in your grandmother and, and in your father about, you know, if you're practicing it the way I am, basically you're doing it wrong. Yeah. Where my view, I, I, I sometimes have these conversations with friends on road trips or, or, you know, with my wife on a slow, like a quiet weekend, just about, I think that, I think that religion maybe grew out of the, the experience someone had of something divine or inexplicable or what we would call the numinous, right? And we want to remain connected. We want to recreate it. How can we have that again? And, and, yeah. and ironically, our effort to do so kind of calcifies or fossilizes it and mm-hmm. takes the life out of it in some, this is my view, <laughs> right? In some well, cases. No, I, I understand what you're saying. You know, it's a, uh, in my point of view, because I share this very similar point of view in, in that regard, at the root of all religion, there's an experience. Someone had an experience with divinity, with life, with God, whatever term wants, one wants to use. Yeah. And we use the language of the environment that surrounds us. Yeah. For example, let's, ta- let's, let's say yoga. When you first start taking a yoga class, you go to the yoga class, you roll out the mat, you start paying attention to the teacher. You start moving, but here's the thing. You, you don't know what anything is, so you're going into the position and you're cranking your neck to see what the teacher is doing. You're in downward dog and you're cranking your neck and you're doing all those other movements, looking around, trying to see what that is. Yeah. And that's when you, when you first start, you're looking for how is it done, how is it done. It's like the mind wants to know. Yeah. With some practice, little by little, you crank your neck less and less and less as you start to recognize what those symbols are, meaning the names, not word dog, uh, and, and things like that. Um, warrior's pose and, and sun salutation. You hear those words and you automatically know, all right, I know what that movement is. Yeah. And you're not looking around, right? Like, am I doing it right? What's yeah, everybody exactly. else doing? <laughs> so that comes with some practice. Yeah. Then eventually what's going to happen is that you know the movements that all of a sudden you stop thinking about it. And for the very first time, you bring your breath into it. Yeah. And all of a sudden, once you're able to bring your breath into it, it's, it's almost like the moment where the mind stops getting in the way and confidence comes in. I know what I'm doing yeah. enough to let go of the need to know because I know. Yeah. And you begin to breathe and you start flowing. You start to flow with the breath. You start to flow, flow, flow. And then eventually one day your mind goes away. Your awareness is present. The breath took you there and you have a moment of clarity, a moment of whatever that is. And you get to the point where you don't even need to listen what the teacher is doing. You're in sync with every single one because you know the flow. You're in it. You're, you're part of it. And all of a sudden, you have that connection of being at one with your breath. When the session is finished, you go, wow. And you want to share it. You want to share it the best you can. So you go to the words you know, which is the language that you learn in that yoga studio, because that's the only reference you have. And you try to bring in something else from all over your environment to put it into words. Although at that moment, you're going on memory. It's no longer the truth. It's just a memory. But you're trying to hold on to it. So little by little, you go into it, put into practice the yoga, and you do your very best to go back into it, sometimes successfully, sometimes not. The person who hears your experience, because when you're sharing that moment, you're, sh- you're basically tuning into that memory using your words. The, worst, the person who is hearing you hasn't had the experience yet, but they hear your words. Now they have to follow what you do. And you think you have to follow it as is because... Well, that's the way it happened to her. It can happen to me this way. That's how it happened to him. It can happen to me too. So little by little, 
And you look for it, you look for it, and you not get it, but you can't, like, no, he did it. I can do it again and again. And sometimes you're so in your head that you never pay attention to it. Sometimes that happens. So some people who hear that tone are able to replicate it. Some people are not. But in our tradition, what we talk about is the main problem the four agreements and all these other books deal with is something called domestication, which is a system of reward and punishment by which we model the behavior of an individual, where if we live up to the expectation, we're worthy of the reward. And if we fall short of that expectation, we're worthy of the punishment. And since we are emotional beings who experience the full spectrum of our emotions, that reward feels like acceptance, which feels like love. And the punishment feels like rejection and the lack thereof of love. It's the way we learn conditional love. I love myself if, I love myself if. So we get so used to that system, we get so attached to that system so that we use that as a motivator to create, to achieve, because that's what we've known. You know, get straight A's, you get a reward. Achieve this, you get a reward. We got that to like, uh, like a, a reward and system. So it gets to the point where we begin to corrupt things. An example would be the four agreements. The telltale sign that we use the four agreements as an instrument of domestication is judging ourselves judging ourselves for taking things personal, judging ourselves for making assumptions and all the rest. In my case, hello, my name is Don Miguel Ruiz Jr. I don't take things personal. I don't make assumptions. <gasps> I forgot the rest of it. Oh no, how can I call myself Don Miguel Ruiz Jr. if I don't know the four agreements? And there's the downward spiral of judgment, punishing myself for not living up to that image of the perfect version of Don Miguel Ruiz Jr. Who doesn't take things personal, doesn't make assumptions, always does his best. He is impeccable with his word. And if I forget a fifth one, be skeptical, but learn to listen, there's a downward spiral again. How can I call myself Don Miguel Ruiz Jr.? So we're used to that reward and punishment model. Yeah. And the example here with the four agreements is that at that moment, we're no longer practicing the four agreements. We're practicing the corruption of it, which is the four conditions. Mm -hmm. The four conditions is because we're so used to that domestication that we judge ourselves for not being impacted with the word. And since I can't give what I do not have, imagine my wife, she was born and raised in Harriman. Honey, here's the four agreements, read it. <laughs> honey, you didn't take, you're taking things personal. You didn't read the book. Oh, honey, you're making assumptions. She's walking in through the door, making noises as we speak. <laughs> and we make judgments and we do all this thing. But at that moment, I'm, used, I'm judging her. Whenever I judge someone, I'm punishing them for an agreement they never made, but I'm forcing them to make the agreement through the judgment. That's the four conditions. I'm say I'm practicing the four agreements, but I'm actually really practicing the four conditions. And here's where a lot of religion and spirituality gets corrupted. Not just spirituality, music. You can corrupt music. You can corrupt fashion. You can corrupt culture. You can corrupt our skin color you can corrupt man, woman, you can corrupt anything. I accept you if, I accept myself if. I can only call myself a yoga, a yogi, if I have that moment of clarity. I can call myself a Toltec only if I live the four agreements. The four agreements are my Bible. By that moment, if we judge ourselves, at that moment, we're no longer using it as an instrument of healing in the same way that the four agreements or the yoga helps. The four conditions is just another way to subjugate ourselves, domesticate ourselves, and to pretend to be something we're not. What happens there is that someone has that aha moment with religion, spirituality. Mm -hmm. They use the words best they can to uh, explain what they've experienced. But for that person who hasn't experienced it yet, well, they only have those words, so they try to apply it. Sometimes they're successful. They're the ones in this case applying the four agreements. Sometimes they're not. And because they're so used to that domestication that they're practicing the four conditions. For me, becoming aware of the difference, the sole difference between the two it's a very important thing because it's the thing that 
allows us to understand what free will is versus a subjugated will or domestication in this case. So for me, all religions are beautiful. Every religion talks of a truth, a moment of clarity, a communion with the divinity. Somewhere along the line, someone learned to practice it the way someone practiced the four agreements, or someone learned to practice the four conditions and can't, they can't tell the difference between the two. To be able to get to that point is the difference between learning from the consequences of our own choices or blindly following without even questioning if it's the truth or not. Thank you for sharing that uh, beautiful discourse on this and, and really the inverse of the, the four agreements. I mean, the four conditions and how those, uh, you know, that can happen with anything like you're saying culture or a fashion or, or music. One thing, one thing I'm curious to know is uh, clearly, you know, love and unconditional love is central to your work mm -hmm. and to being this artist of life as, as you describe, how can we, learn to love unconditionally? What do we well, have to do or who do we have to be? Well, that's the thing. You know, as the question arises, who do we have to be? We already created an image of what it's supposed to do. Ego is easier to understand as a function rather than a concept. The function of ego is to keep the illusion alive. That to me, that's how I understand ego. So the illusion of the perfect thing, that's what you're yeah. saying? You can say that image by which we model ourselves or domesticate ourselves. You know, if that, if the problem is domestication, which is that system of reward and punishment, there is a model by which I'm domesticating myself with. For example, to say the perfect version of me is to be 27 years old, weigh 170 pounds and be 27 years old. Mm -hmm. I say that's my, and have full set of hair. I look at myself in the mirror and that's just not the truth. I weigh 193 pounds. I'm 45 years old, my hair is what it is, you know, receding very nicely. That's my truth. But if I look at myself in the mirror and what I see doesn't match my ideal, that image of perfection, that model by which I'm domesticating myself, well, I'm gonna castigate myself. You fat bleep, you old fat bald bleep. And all those judgments, that downward spiral of judgment. So, that's what ego is. We create an image by which we domesticate ourselves and we defend it at all costs. Kind of like Don Quixote preferring to see giants instead of windmills. And no. if he does see the windmills, it's because of his arch nemesis put a huge spell on across the land to make all the giants into windmills just to make him look bad. At that moment, he preferred the illusion over the truth. What does that have to do with conditional love and unconditional love? To put it in a way, the difference, conditional love only sees what it wants to see. I love you if, which means the opposite of is unconditional love is the willingness to see life as is. The willingness to see myself as I am. The willingness to accept myself. This is who I am, the sum of every decision that I've ever made and the youngest I will ever be. If we can have that for ourselves, then we can see that with everyone else. Instead of my wife, I see Susan, the woman who loves me and whom I love, whom we both said yes to. If I only see her as my wife and project a mask of who she's supposed to be, then I have run the risk of not knowing who she really is, especially if I'm domesticated to my own point of view, just like Don Quixote. Don Quixote doesn't see the woman that Dulcinea really is. He only sees Dulcinea. And he's going to domesticate that girl or that woman to live up to that image because that's what he wants to see. So conditional love is that. Love, with or without conditions, Let's just say that love is an energy that, that allows us to create a bond with ourselves and with other people. Let's just say that that's simply energy. And I'm the source of that energy. 
Just like I'm not this body, I'm the force that animates it. I'm not this mind, I'm the force that animates it. And I know that because in that moment of my last breath, of my last heartbeat, I don't take either one of them with me. Then my love only exists because I'm here to manifest it. My love exists because I exist. Now, am I going to share that with conditions the way I've been taught? You know, through society, through community, through whoever was in my life who domesticated me to their point of view. That love has to be earned by living up to an image that doesn't exist. Or I'm aware that my love exists and I can share it with anyone I'm with. All that is required is take myself, get myself out of the way so that it's there. We can, meaning by that, take out all the filters, all my distorted point of views and be willing to see life as is, to accept. So to me, that's what unconditional love is. The willingness to see the people I love just as they are, as opposed to whatever image I project onto them, mm -hmm. which requires, of course, the willingness to listen. Yeah. yeah, And to see, right? Mm -hmm. To pay mm -hmm. attention, to be present. Yeah, even when we don't like what we see or we don't agree with it. Mm -hmm. Um, and I can see here, I think, where your brother talks about to unlearn, right? Mm -hmm. the, the expectations and the, you know, so forth of how things should be, how people should be. Mm -hmm. um, so this is maybe the very Western rational uh, part of me asking this then. Okay, so say, say I understand so somebody listening. Okay, so they hear what you're saying. They can... Is something they want, but they don't know how to do it. How do we do this? Is this a plant journey? Is this more meditation? Is this like some chanting? Is there some ritual or ceremony? Like how do I get myself to be less judgmental? How do I get myself to see without the filters? Like as a practical matter, how do I do that? A moment of clarity. In the same way that an alcoholic or drug addict wakes up one morning to see the truth of what they've created. They have a moment of clarity. Mm. A moment of clarity without any action is just a thought that passes in the wind, but a moment of clarity followed by action becomes a pivotal moment in our life. It is the moment where we become aware of what we've created, what we've done, how I've used my own intent to continue to believe. There's a couple of phrases that I love that I, I, I'm going to quote here again. I quote these a lot, so I love saying it because to me they resonate. First one is Eleanor Roosevelt. No one can make me feel inferior without my consent. In other ways, no one can domesticate me without my consent. And how do I give consent? By believing it. Mm. It's like the image of, uh, of Siddhartha with Mara, when after, you, after Siddhartha uh, is able to maintain his discipline and resist the temptation by, of Mara's daughters, Mara gets so upset that he couldn't get Siddhartha, so he sends his armies to destroy him, and those armies send all these arrows, and Siddhartha sees those arrows, and he turns them into roses because he didn't give him permission to hurt him. I see that analogy that all the beliefs in my belief system have power because I keep saying yes to it. Yeah. All those domesticated point of views, all those judgments have power in me that resonate with me because I keep saying yes, which leads me to my second quote I'm going to um, uh, say. Uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson says, the truth exists whether you believe in it or not. Of course, before that, he says, that's the thing about science. The truth exists whether you believe in it or not. But uh, that phrase, the truth exists whether you believe in it or not. It doesn't need humanity for it to exist. The truth exists with or without you. Yeah. The truth exists with or without me. In contrast, this is me learning from that phrase, a belief. A belief only exists for as long as I say yes to it. And the moment I change that yes into a no, that belief will cease to exist, which means as soon as I don't believe it, it ceases to exist, which means a belief only exists with me. It needs me. It needs humanity for it to exist. Just like the four agreements and the four conditions, see, we can tell the difference between the truth and a belief 
or lies or ideas with that kind of, kind of thing. But I believe it's more important than this one reflects better. If you can tell the difference between the truth and the belief, then you can say that that which I see in the mirror is the truth. The judgments I hear about what I see in the mirror, those are beliefs. All those judgments about being 45, being uh, a little overweight, a little bald, and whatever other judgments that anyone can resonate with, those only have power because we said yes to it. At that moment, that's the moment of clarity. Mm -hmm. All those judgments I have only have power because I said yes to it. I continue to believe my domesticators. And here's the thing. My domesticators stopped domesticating me a long time ago. But I continue to tell myself that over and over by continuing to say yes to it. Yeah. And there's an image my brother says that I also like to use here. It's like a scorpion that stings itself over and over again with its own tail, administering the poison that it means for someone else to oneself. Well, those beliefs by which we continue to hurt ourselves is kind of like saying yes to them when we believe them. It's exactly drinking our own poison or that scorpion that stings itself over and over again. Yeah. So the moment you become aware that you're doing it, that's the moment of choice. If you choose not to do anything about it, the cycle will continue. It's just a thought that passes in the wind. Mm -hmm. But if in that moment of clarity you have, you made a choice, you know what? I don't want to do this again. That ability, we shift. Kind of like an alcoholic or drug addict. We take a step in a different direction and we change life and we go through that, um, that hangover, you know? When you're, when you're going through that alcohol uh, withdrawal, the best way, what you're used to is, what one, what one is used to is the hair of the dog. Take a sip of beer or something and the headache will go away. But yeah. you just punted the problem. You, it just kept going. Well, if we decide that in that moment of clarity to change direction, the whole world changes. And all of a sudden, all these beautiful traditions have so many instruments that allows us to let go of conditional love. Not just the four agreements, but the teachings of Deepak Chopra, William, Marianne Williamson, Jesus, Buddha, Siddhartha, Mohammed, psychology, psychiatry, Alcoholics Anonymous. All these beautiful traditions teach us how to let go of conditional love and embrace unconditional love. But if you begin to clean it out, to clear all that filter, all the, those attached beliefs, then we can see that all of those have instruments that allows us to heal. Mm -hmm. We just go to the one that resonates. It's kind of like going to the one therapy center that resonates with us or the psychiatrist, psychologist, or group setting, or workshop, or uncle or aunt that you have confidence in, or brother or cousin that you decide to also share with. Mm -hmm. and you let go at that moment these are all instruments and you will go with the one that resonates with you action so you can say that a teacher once taught me this lesson just to close that question up enlightenment the key to enlightenment is effort that's what she said the key to enlightenment is effort. To me, effort is using the energy that animates this body, that animates this mind to manifest something. That's what effort is, putting one foot in front of the other. Discipline is simply remembering to make that choice every day. Or you can say discipline is remembering to apply that effort every day. That's it. It's, forget about the drill sergeant in your head. It's just remembering that today I want to say yes to it, but I want to say no to it. And success is simply following through. And that is going to adapt itself to whichever method. It could be prayer. It could be a group. It could be action. It could be creativity. It could be therapy. It could be an incredible array of things because 
there's so many people out there that similar to my grandmother, Sarita, had a moment that helped them and they decided to help others. And that's what we go towards. We find, we give ourselves the permission to heal. Yeah. And that's what it is. Yeah. It reminds me of something I once heard about. There are many, many paths up the mountain, but the view from the top is the same. Mm-hmm. Right? Like all these different approaches we might, or the teachers we might choose to learn from, but in some fundamental way, you know, I think we're ultimately arriving at the same, the same place. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this idea too, about, you know, our thoughts and, and this domestication, um, this was an idea that transformed my life. Just even knowing, you know, a thought isn't true or false. It's a thought and you can choose to believe it or choose to disbelieve it. And, mm-hmm. and that we always have choice, Mm -hmm. Right. And so what can in some way be so simple to say in a conversation like this literally has the power to transform one's entire life if we Mm -hmm. remember and apply it. Yeah. And it, and it feels overwhelming at first, like anything, you know, I, I can say right now, for example, I've, I ran six full marathons and I ran 25 half marathons. Holy cow. Congratulations on that, by the way. Thank you. Thank you so much. (laughs) Eight years ago, I could barely run two miles. You know, I had this uh, issue with my back, my lower back, that my legs went numb, and I had to relearn how to run again or walk even alone. But I started with two miles, and then I created a playlist where I ran, walk one song, ran one song, walk. Then the intervals changed. I ran two songs. I ran three songs little by little. It was hard work, obviously. And running a marathon, a half marathon, is hard work, 18 weeks. But it all sounds... It all sounds easy when you're on the other side. But the effort is worth it. You know what? The first time I ran five miles, a huge epiphany happened to me. First, it was the first time in my life that I ran five miles. Before that, I my sport before running was soccer. And, you know, stop and go, stop and go. And youth, I didn't think about it. I wasn't really uh, paying attention to it. But in my 30s, here I am learning to do this. So when I finally crossed five miles for the very, for the very first time, I crossed a threshold that my self-doubt told me I couldn't cross. I proved myself wrong. And the best question of my life came, what else can I do? Wow. And it came with the best response I could ever say. Anything. Knowing that I can. It takes effort. It takes all this hard work, but it's so worth it because it's something you get to create. And there's nothing, well, there's a lot of things, but it's a wonderful feeling when you cross thresholds that your self-doubt told you couldn't cross and realize you can. And not just with, in my case, a physical activity, when you write a book, when you create music, when you're doing a job, when you when you let go of alcohol or all these things, you know, it's like, you, you you stand by and you look at what you've done. You know, sometimes we do all our intent just to run, 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 really put your pet down, just like work, 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 work. And all of a sudden, if you look, look up and you look around and you see all the fruit of your labor, all the stuff you've achieved, you go, wow. And the funny thing is that as soon as you say it, it sounds easy. And the only reason why it sounds easy is because the words make it sound easy. Yeah, but the effort that we actually apply for it while we're doing it is tough. So you always have to find what motivates you. So you can say, what happens when you let go of domestication? Because the thing about domestication is that there's a motivator that drives you to do it. You know, the grass is greener. I love myself as soon as I, as soon as I graduate high school, as soon as I graduate college, then I'll be somebody. What happens when you let go of that motivator, which is conditional love? That's the thing about that domestication. The motivator is conditional love. Passion. Passion is, let's not confuse it with the corruption of it, which is obsession. Obsession is like only focus on this one thing and I can only achieve it. I can only accept myself if I have it, if I have it. And if you do achieve it, you create another, for example, let's say I qualified for Boston. I can only call myself a runner if I qualify for Boston. If I don't, I'm just a jogger. 
And I know people who do that. Like, oh, yeah. they, they, they put people down by calling them joggers. And like, no, he's not a runner. He's a jogger. You know, what is that? But let's say that you're obsessed with it and you qualify. Now you're like, no, now I have to break the record. And I won't call myself a runner until I break the And at that moment, you never accept yourself who you are. That's an obsession. Passion, on the other hand, looks different. The goal is just the excuse to do it. Run, training the, that Sunday when race day happens is just the excuse to run for 18 weeks prior. Mm. That's the difference. I enjoy doing what I love to do. It's like I enjoy doing the craft that I do. And that's the difference. I'm, instead of chasing an illusory carrot, I'm eating the carrot that nourishes me to take a step forward. I love that view. I love the view that the goal is just an excuse to follow the passion. Mm -hmm. That's, that's fantastic. And I've, maybe this is some of the Eastern studies I've had, but um, some of my teachers have, have said goals are useless. (laughs) All goals are useless or at best, you know, their value is in what we become or what we learn and experience along the way. Yeah, well, that's the, the thing, and I can see why they would say that, because we are so used to domestication that we will corrupt those goals. We will use goals. It's a slippery slope. Yeah. Kind of like an identity is an, a, a slippery slope. An identity can become that model by which we domesticate ourselves. And in this, my case, Don Miguel Ruiz Jr., you can also say, my goal is to live the four agreements every day. And you can see already the, the slippery slope of using the four conditions there. Yeah. Well, if we use goals as an instrument of domestication, all goals are corrupted. And I can see where the teacher would say they're useless. Yeah. But once you clean it up, once you clean it up and I'm perfect just the way I am because I'm alive. This is the grass is greener where I'm standing because it happens to be where I'm standing right now. This is where I'm at. Right. A goal just becomes, all right, where do I want to focus my attention? Where do I want to focus my intent? I want to go in that direction. Okay. Why do I want to go the direction? Because I want to enjoy the, the journey there. Right. So that uh, point is just a focal point. And, and, and I think the tendency too that goals have of taking us out of the present moment, right? Like you're saying about, I will only be worthy or I will only be complete if I achieve this or measure up. But the the act, you know, while moving in a direction, being fully present and engaged, you know, being able to do that. And I think it's an interesting view that you're offering about the corruption of goals. I, and I tend to think, yeah, goals, I don't, I don't necessarily agree that goals are worthless, but mm-hmm. I can see how there can be a way that they, they divide us or they become an instrument of that domestication. Yeah. And it, and, and it all requires the willingness to do the work within us, you know, because if we don't ha- we haven't done that work, then, you know, we will corrupt yoga. Going back to that image, you know, well, like I, I can only practice yoga only and I can't call, until I have that moment where my breath, I'm moving with my breath. Yeah. Until then, I'm not a yoga practitioner. You know, you can see how that happens. You know, we can see that in spirituality. We can see that with our diets, you know, with the way we eat, with the music. That's why I say we can corrupt all these beautiful things yeah. because somewhere in creating hierarchy, is the result of that domestication. You know, if I'm below on the hierarchy, then I'm not worthy of love. I have to be the very top. Otherwise, I'm nobody. And because we keep telling, we keep believing in the person that told us that you're nobody until you reach that goal. Yeah. Yeah, Miguel, I want to I want to ask you about your most recent book. So I know in 2018 you released the seven secrets to healthy, happy relationships. And this is your fifth book. If I'm yes, right. yes, my fifth book and with my dear friend, Heather Ashamara. Yes. Yes. And, uh, and I also understand that this book is a, this is a result of workshops that you taught. So you took the content from, from what you had been teaching in person, and then you put it between the covers of a book and mm-hmm. out in the world. I read it. I enjoyed it immensely. It, it, it was one of those books for me that it gave me some new, new language. Like I didn't have the concept of domestication, but I saw it in myself. And it also did the thing where it said, Oh, I knew that. I just didn't know. I knew that (laughs) in a lot of places, you know, but let me ask you. So with this book, the seven secrets of healthy, happy relationships, why did you write it? Why did you devote so much of your life to creating that workshop? And then ultimately to writing the book, why was this book number five? Why is, who is it for and what's it meant to do for them? Sure. 
Well, the the book was uh, Heather Ashes' uh, baby. She came up to me and asked me if I wanted to participate participate in this program. Now, when she came up to me, it was a, a project, an, an audio class, an audio workshop for Sounds True. And then when our publisher, because we have both at the time the same publisher, Hierophant Publishing, Randy Davila, he heard about it like, oh, let me get the, the book rights for that. So now we had a, a workshop and a book, you know. So when she asked me, I was in a particular part of my life. I had healed the relationship with my first love. Uh, my relationship with my love, uh, I was 18 years old. We, uh, it was about that high school sweetheart that we loved each other. But, you know, when you're that young, love is an instrument that is beautiful but can also hurt. So you can say that I, I, it's like the image of two porcupines kissing, you know, our quills just fit the right place every time we want to get close, you know. And, we, I, you know, we did that. So time and time again, we broke up, we got back together because we loved each other. But every time, you know, we would hurt each other and, you know, we broke up again and then we try to be friends and we would hook up because that's what we're used to. But then the quills hit, we, you know, and then it was like that for several years until it hurt and we got angry just by the thought of hearing each other. But, mm-hmm. you know, looking back on it, it's the relationship that impacted all my relationships. Like the, it's the head of the freight train that when it finally hit, boom, 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 it's like that one. Eventually, uh, it all came to a head because I, I, I fell in love again. And we were, I was just a woman I wanted to marry. But all these wounds, all this stuff just infected my present. You know, it's like, it's like carrying the weight of an old corpse, and meaning myself. I was holding on to all these old wounds, and it was infecting every relationship and that thing was heavy and was stinky and it finally crashed. And the thing is that before I could project blame, but this is someone I couldn't project anything. She did nothing wrong. It was all myself, my insecurities, my own selfishness, my own. It's a moment. It's it's my moment of clarity. You know, people have, Moments of clarity. My father had a car accident. My, bro- my brother went blind. My grandmother almost died. I had a moment of heartbreak. I lost someone I loved and I couldn't project blame. It was all me. I wasn't what I pretended to be. And you can say it's a moment where I really began to practice the family tradition. Yes, at that point, I've been an apprentice for, since I was 14 years old and I can recite and give a class and all that. But then I had a moment of clarity when I was a certain age, at the age of 23, 24. And then by 27, it all fell apart. And I finally put it to work. I started to work on myself. I really applied the lessons. I really, I took a whole year off from relationships so I can really give myself that time to heal. I moved places. I changed my whole thing and focused on myself. And luckily enough, I, I healed in time from when I met my wife, you know, we were, I was ready. I wasn't, I wasn't afraid. I, I wasn't afraid to say no. I wasn't afraid. I wasn't afraid to love anymore. And luckily for me, my wife came when she came and we continued to work through things. You know, we, she and I have worked through a lot of things. And then Social media came in, you know, at the time, MySpace, eventually Facebook, and became friends with a lot of my high school friends. And all of a sudden, the name appeared, and there she was. The, the woman, the girl from when you were My eight- first love. Yeah, my first love. Uh, yeah. I'll leave it like that. Yeah. I sent a friend request, and she accepted. And we started talking, and kind of like, kind of like, hey, how you doing? Yeah, how you doing? Good, good. At the time, I was living in... In Rockland, California, she was living and still in San Diego, where I was born and raised. So the next time I drove down, we're like, let's let's meet up, let's let's introduce our family. She was uh, married and has her son, and I'm married and I have my two kids. We came together and, and we got the families together, kind of like that was our safety net in a way. We're like, all right, this is we're surrounded with safety, and we're talking. You know, and and it happened for a good four or five years that we 
now we talked, we were friends. And then on the eve of my second, no, no, my first marathon in San Diego, it's a San Diego rock and roll, uh, rock and roll marathon. Um, I went down there by myself and she and I hung out with her son. Her son went to play and we just talked. And for the first time we, we were alone and we started talking. And I finally, I apologized. I apologize, not the apology of an ex-boyfriend, but that of someone who knows the difference between guilt and remorse. And what I mean by that is this. Guilt is punishing yourself over and over again for something you wanted to do. And every time you think about it, you judge yourself. Por mi culpa, por mi culpa, por mi culpa. You judge, judge, judge. But if life were give the chance to give you if life were to give you the chance to do it again, you would still do it because that's what you wanted to do. That's guilt. Remorse, on the other hand, is that you see the consequences of your actions. You see the ripple effects of the choices you made and how that affected other people. And you see that pain, you see the consequences, you know, you're not like projecting, you're seeing it, you're owning it. And you're aware of it. And here's where the, it, it really is different. If life were the chance to give you, if life were to give you the chance to do it again, you wouldn't. Not because you got caught, but because you know what the consequences are and you say it's not worth it. Mm -hmm. Hurting someone else is not worth it. You can say that's what I learned, which also means I heard her for the very first time. I owned my choices and I didn't ask for forgiveness. I apologize. There's a huge difference. The apology, the forgiveness comes for her and she's, she's the one who res responds to that. But I owned up. It's like, it was like the first time I ever saw her as a human being rather than me projecting that she was my girlfriend. When that happened, something incredible happened. All of a sudden, she started owning up to her side. It was like both of us owning, like, like, you know, the maturity of being in our late 30s or something like that. And all of a sudden, the words I wanted to hear since I was 18 years old comes out. I loved you very much, she said. And I said the same thing. Of course, we both said we wouldn't have lasted because now we're adults. We totally know that eventually that would have happened. But we gave each other the ability to heal the relationship. Wow. When Heather Ash came and asked me to participate in this project, that's where I was coming from. You can say uh, secret number uh, four, which is of uh, healing. And the original title of the project was The Soul of Intimacy. When you have... When you don't heal your old wounds, your intimacy is going to be closed. You're not going to open up. Mm -hmm. But as you heal, your intimacy is going to open, otherwise known as joy. Your ability, the secret to joy, goes hand in hand with the ability to heal because it's the moment where we're no longer afraid to love. And all of a sudden, the channels of communication are open, which is what uh, she and my first love, my first love, and I did. We first, we finally talked as equals, not as that projected image that we once had of one another. And it was a good one, and it felt good. So, and release is is the equivalent of mean, who are you today? You know, because I'm not the same person I was when I was 18 years old. In fact, with my wife, same thing. We we were both 28. But we're not the same person we were at 28. She's not the same person she was at 30 or 35 or 40. And I'll stop right there. We are different people. In fact, she's not even the same person she was yesterday. She's not even the, first, the same person she was at the beginning of this week because life happens. And when life happens and it impacts our life, it changes. You know, we change with every action and choice we make. It impacts us. So when I contributed to that book, it was meant to heal, to help other people heal. But you can't heal what you don't have. So you can say, sorry, you can't give what you do not have. So in order for even uh, be able to heal that with other people, you heal it within yourself, which is the first 
three secrets of commitment, freedom, and awareness. It's, it's the commitment to myself to heal. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like I, get, I heal with my own permission and I follow through. Like that, that, that line, that lesson of uh, th- uh, enlightenment, the key to enlightenment is effort. Freedom is to be able to say yes and no with a complete freedom of life. You know, the thing that domestication does is that it takes away our ability to make a choice. We let our beliefs and conditions say yes and no for us. We don't own it. We, we lost that respect for ourselves to make those decisions. And that comes with awareness, becoming aware, what are my triggers? What, what am I saying yes to? Like, like I was saying before, knowing the difference between the truth and, and a belief that's what is my belief and what is the truth? Well, if you apply scrutiny to it, you can tell the difference. A truth will, be, uh, will exist with or without you. It'll survive anything. A belief, as soon as you become aware of it and you realize you can change that into yes to no, it ceases to exist. And you, with the meaning of words, the expression of a symbol, my domesticated point of view, you do that within yourself. You heal the relationship within you. Once you learn to feel that relationship within you, that gives you the opportunity to heal. Because say, for example, if she were to give me the chance and I didn't do any of the work and she came with that opportunity, well, I'm just going to hurt her again because that's what I, I'm used to. Yeah. But if I do the work and she gave me the chance, and chances are she might have given me a chance before, but my quills were up and I didn't even notice that hers were down. <laughs> I just had mine up, you know? That probably happened several times. Mm. But when I finally did the work, my quills weren't up. In fact, they were, well, most of them were healed and they weren't even there, which means that I was willing to listen for the very first time and own my actions. Yes, I did it. And some, when someone feels heard, trust comes in and love blossoms where there's trust. Yeah, that's beautiful. Well, I feel, I feel fortunate for you that you had that healing experience where I know many people don't, whether it's through, you know, relationships that continue to be acrimonious or whether they're ended, you know, prematurely by death or whatever reason we, we don't, ever find that healing that I think we're all looking for. Mm -hmm. We continue to live these patterns of conditional love when I think what we're yearning for is that unconditional experience, both to give and to receive, Yeah, but we don't necessarily know how. I think it's wonderful that, that you had that, but also that you're teaching, teaching this um, to others. And as I said, I took away a lot from the book. No, thanks. One thing that I'm curious to ask you about before we transition uh, to the, to the next part of our conversation that uh, I hope will be a contribution to, to those listening. And I know it will be to me. It is about forgiveness. And just a moment ago, you, you talked about the difference between apology and forgiveness. And, and in the book, you talk about forgiveness and how to do it, what it even is, that kind of thing. But this is uh, like you books, entire books have been written on this, right? And I think every spiritual teacher has talked about this and some of the greatest leaders in history how do you think about forgiveness and how can we achieve it? Like, especially if it's not just a old wound, but it's ongoing. Sure. Well, I'm going to use a lesson that I learned actually in 2017. A teacher in Sacramento was giving a, a class, a series of classes there. And there was a teacher there that, you know, when we're talking about it, he said it. So I don't remember his name, but uh, it's not originally from me. That's what I'm saying to say it, but. It's a lesson that resonates, and I'm going to quote him, and it goes like this. Forgiveness is the moment you no longer wish the past was any different. It is the moment you accept it and you let it go. That was it. And it resonates with me. One, the past no longer exists. I can't go back there and change a yes to no or no to yes. There's no life in the past. It only exists in my mind as a memory. And it probably didn't happen the way I think it happened. Just like the future doesn't exist yet, it only exists in my imagination, and I don't know what's going to happen. The only place where life is real, when the truth exists, 
is in this present moment, this moment right now. This is my truth. So the moment where we accept it, that it happened, is the moment where we are no longer focusing on, it should have been this, it should have been that. You can't go back there. You can't change that yes into a no or no to a yes. will no longer exist there. Yeah. You accept it. And you let it go. Once again, that image of that scorpion comes back in mind. That image is beautiful. Of a scorpion that stings itself over and over again with its own tail. Sometimes when we think about the past, we're using the past to go against us. So to let it go simply means to no longer use that stinger against me. I'm no longer going to use the past to hurt myself over and over again, especially when it's not happening right now. Yeah. Because right now, life is good. And, and that's the thing about life. You know, for example, the mind is so powerful and it does incredible things. Example, I am my son, my firstborn was born, my son. I'm holding him in my arms and I'm feeling that beautiful communion, that blessing. I am such a happy man. And I'm holding my boy and smelling. I can hear him. I can feel him. And my mind was fertile ground for fear in the form of a thought, actually a concept, or not even a concept, something that really happens. SIDS, Southern Infant Death Syndrome. I read about it. I heard about it. The idea, the thought just popped in my head in that moment when I'm holding it. And all of a sudden, I experienced a fear like I've never experienced before. It, it, it was crippling that fear. Nothing changed. Nothing changed in this room. My son is still alive. It was just a thought that all of a sudden I could lose him. And it la that fear stayed with me intense for several months until my father saw me that I was just at a verge of tears. And he says, Miguel, go fix yourself. Face it. And the way I faced it is like I turned on the news. There was new. Unfortunately, there's news about children being hurt all the time. And I just imagined that was my boy, and I just cried like crazy, but I let it out. And since then, it's gotten better and better and better. You know, that fear will always be there. I'm a father. Like, I have a, a daughter and a son. It's, I, I don't have any anxieties about myself or life. It's just my kids. But back then, those few, first few weeks or months, it was intense. The power of a thought that blossoms at the right time can impact your life in such a way. In this example, you become aware that that is something I am so aware of. Now, to forgive myself. It happened. I had that fear. I was in the right place in the right time for that fear to blossom in my life and wreak havoc the way it did. And I accept it. And I let it go. My children can die at any minute. And that's the truth. And that's the truth about me. I could die at any minute. Like you were saying before, every relationship ends. Relationships end by choice, by life, or by death. In my life, I experienced the end of a relationship by life, which is uh, my girlfriend in, in college. And the, when we graduated, she moved back to Berlin. I stayed in California. It was the days before Facebook and MySpace and all that kind of stuff. So it ended. You know, that's the way, that's the way it happened. Uh, the, the By choice is what we know as a breakup. And I've learned about that many times. By death. One day, my wife or I will see the other, close our eyes, and give our last breath. All relationships end in the same way that my life and everyone's going to die. Once I accept my mortality, then what am I wasting my time for that moment that's going to come? It's like in Game of Thrones. What do you tell the angel of death? Not today? Well, not today. I'm alive right now. Life is saying yes to me. My wife is saying yes to me. This little ring that I have only has power because we both said I do. But my wife has every right to change her mind to from a yes to a no 
especially if I do anything stupid, she has all the right to change her mind, which means that symbol of my wedding ring only means something for as long as we both say yes. It is the thing that helps us not to take for granted those people we love and the people who are in our life. We accept that everything will end. Once you accept that it is, you appreciate that it's not today. You enjoy it. You're here to be with it. And that moment, forgiveness is a little easier because why waste our time with something that's going to prevent us from having this relationship? Especially within myself, because in that self-administering of that emotional poison, I'm the only one who really feels it. Yeah. So when I'm fe- forgive someone, I'm basically it's the moment where I'm no longer gonna use them and their actions to go against me. Mm-hmm. So for me, that's what the act of forgiveness is. Now we forgive when we're ready. If we're not ready to forgive, that's perfectly fine. It's all about breaking domestication, remember? If we say we have to be enlightened, so I have to forgive. But if you're not ready to forgive, that's your truth. And that's that's the truth of who you are. Yeah, it's okay. I, I think that's where I know for myself, and I think many people get what I would say hung up on or caught up on forgiveness with that very thing. Like it's something we should do. But if we're honest, when we look inside, if we're unwilling to try to do so and then make ourselves wrong for not doing it when we really don't want to. <laughs> that, yeah. and, and that's the thing. That's what domestication is. At that moment, it's forcing our hands. But the thing is, the emotional body is not ready. The wound is too pa- painful to touch. Yeah. To honor ourselves is to say, this is how I'm feeling, but I'm choosing not to let that poison affect my choices or the way I treat you. I'm going to redirect in a different direction. You know, we can create the most beautiful work of art and the most beautiful ballads. You know, there's people out there who've made a living out of writing those songs, you know, of, of heartbreak and, and, and betrayal and things like that. Yeah. It's a beautiful thing when we re- we're able to redirect it and give ourselves that time to heal. And when we are ready, and usually, that time usually comes when we're tired of feeling that pain, is when we give ourselves that permission to Heal and the last step of healing is forgiveness, which is once again to let it go and accept that it happened. And taking a step forward is leaving it behind. I have to make sure that's not my son. <laughs> the happy dogs. Sorry. Sorry about that. It's all good. Because I want the dog won't stop barking until I open. Hey, hi. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. You too. Okay. That was the real reason. Once, as soon as I open it, he stops barking. <laughs> like and he's got you he trained. Asleep. Oh, yeah. He's got me domesticated. <laughs> there, you go. there you go. Awesome. Cool. All right. Well, that, that was perfect. And I think, uh, I think for me that, that was a wonderful, that was a wonderful back and forth about that topic. So unless there's anything more you want to say before we, we keep going, uh, we'll keep going. Okay. Follow the lead. Awesome. All right. So we'll go ahead and transition now to the enlightening lightning round. Again, this is a variety of questions, relatively short questions on a variety of topics. Uh, my aim is to ask the question and let you answer as long as you want, and I'll work to keep us moving through this. It's mm-hmm. about nine questions. Okay. Question number one, please complete the following sentence with something other than a box of chocolates. Life is like a... <laughs> Joy ride. Okay. Number two, here I'm borrowing Peter Thiel's question. What important truth do very few people agree with you on? Effort. Will you say a little more about that? Well, like I was saying before, effort is the energy uh, to take a step forward, using the energy that animates his body, that animates his mind to make something. Mm-hmm. I 
enjoy creating and people go at their own rate. Something I have to learn to take a step back. You know, like it took me a while to learn that people heal on their own schedule and not on mine. You know, something that I had to let go. It's like, I've been able to heal a lot of relationships with a lot of people in my past and there's people who don't. And unfortunately, one of the things that I didn't learn, I learned the hard way is people heal in their own time, not mm-hmm. mine. Mm-hmm. To translate that with effort, we all apply it differently. You know, like some people, like they, for an example would be a physical challenge. Like the, my, my friend has a six-week challenge of working out this much time. You know, she set us up this Facebook group where we all, and I'm like, they're going, okay, let's do it. And every day I'm posting, posting, posting. And I'm realizing at one point, I'm like, hey, am I the only one doing this? <laughs> and everyone's in different stages. You know, some people are, they, they put in what, what that is. Like I have a friend who, oh, if I don't, if I, if I don't work out in the morning, then I'm not going to work out. Mm-hmm. You know? Or they do this and they have all reasons and they're not excuses. They're, it's just the way they are. So how we use effort is different. You know, it's like as a father trying to motivate my kids to do something, you know, for example, my daughter is incredible with her motivation when it comes to the things she loves to do mm-hmm. in regards to uh, physical activity. It's, it's hard to get her to do anything. Luckily for me, she she's motivated by her, her homework and her school work. That's her effort. My you son, are lucky you know, with all that's a different thing. Sorry. You are a lucky parent in that regard. <laughs> that yeah, she's exactly. motivated. Yeah. 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 She's motivated by her homework. She's, I'm, I'm, I'm riding that wave of her need to compete. And she ha- she decided not to compete physically, but academically. So I'm like, all right, I'll stick with that. But and my, 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 my wife's different. My friends are different. So we all have different stages of how to use our effort. Whereas I, I'm one of those people who's like, go, 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 go. You know, it's like, for example, with, with knowing I was going to be in an interview with you, I postponed my workout this morning because I've learned that if I have a hard workout, my interview is not so clear. So I said, okay, I'm going to save my energy to let it all out with you. You know, because if I let it all out during the workout, it goes away. So that's where the disagreement, sometimes everyone sees it differently. Some people like are much more hardcore than me. A lot of people are in a different place of like the bare minimum, you know? Mm. So, that's where I say we, we don't see eye to eye. We all have a different gauge of how to apply that effort. I got it. Okay. Thank you. And thank you for saving your energy. The best part is foregoing the workout for them for this interview. Oh, yeah. Well, it, it, it's, I, I've learned that. I've learned that lesson. It's like, you know, it, it, it's, uh, you can work out and do those kind of things. But, you know, if, if it's, for example, if I'm doing a lecture at night or at four o'clock or five o'clock, I know my body. I can do a workout maybe around eight o'clock or nine o'clock at the very most 11 and then rest. I just got to rest. So to mm-hmm. let it all out, it's mm-hmm. kind of like with coffee. If I drink a cup of coffee past noon, I'm not sleeping that night. It's just, mm-hmm. it's just, you have to know your body. This willingness yeah. to know your body. Yeah. That's part, part of the journey. Yeah. Learning ourselves. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Question number three, if you were required to wear a t-shirt with a slogan on it or a phrase or a saying or a quote or a quip, what would the shirt say? If you were required to wear it every day for the rest of your life, what would you wear every day? <laughs> Not today. <laughs> I love it. Okay. Although, although, although it came, it came close. The first one I was going to say is the force runs strong in my family. Mm. Awesome. I have that shirt too. <laughs> okay. Today. Question number four, what book other than one of your own have you gifted or recommended most often? That's a good one. Um, for different reasons. Wow, I have a lot of books, so I'm just going to go what's top of my head. Uh, How to Raise an Adult by uh, Julie. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm forgetting her. I, have, I, want, I want to say the author's name correctly. I know that Julie Lightcott Hames. Yes. Yep. 
That's her. You got it. This that one, I'm game? giving out copies uh, quite a bit. And, and of course, the other one is The Autistic Brain by Temple Grain. Mm-hmm. Those are the two books I've given out the most. I know. My wife's not here, so she left. Okay. All right. Okay, question number five. So you've traveled a lot in your life. What's one travel hack, meaning something you do or something you take with you when you travel, to make your travel less painful or more enjoyable? I travel a lot. It's going to have to be my phone because it has all my music in it. So I ha- headphones and my music, which is in my cell phone nowadays if i which is better than walking around with a big album of cds that i used to carry around with me yeah music is life isn't it yeah so it's it's definitely uh, my headphones and music all right question number six what's one thing you started or stopped doing in order to live or age well drinking alcohol I stopped, I, I stopped drinking alcohol five, almost five years ago because I have sleep apnea. Mm. And I was waking up with heart palpitations every time I had a drink. And I was able to tell because I, I, luckily I didn't drink that often. But when I did, it, it showed up. So it was, it, it, the, 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 the process of, uh, of, what's the expression I'm trying to remember? Um, uh, Eliminating little by little. Um, yeah. uh, let me find out that alcohol and sleep apnea are not good for my body because when you drink alcohol, it relaxes the muscles. And when we have sleep apnea, then that intensifies your sleep apnea, which means I'm not getting oxygen into my body. So the reason why I was having heart palpitations is that the heart was doing its very best to send blood up to my brain to get oxygen to it otherwise i was going to be losing more brain cells than i have so the moment i became aware of that and it was a truth it's a moment of clarity you can say i stopped drinking because i wanted to live you know because if i continued unchecked with that then one night i would have had either a heart attack or a stroke now mind you a heart attack is one thing either you survive or you don't a stroke you know, if it's, it's a, it's a lose, lose situation, you know, it, it's, it, and it's a horrible Russian roulette. Yeah. So because of that, and I was 40 years old when I, this happened, I realized, you know what, that's it. I'm, you know, unlike when I was in my twenties, like, I'm not going to drink anymore or whatever. Now this, this time I'm like, I'm, I'm in the zone, you know, I'm, I'm 40 years old. My, I, I, you know, the heart attacks and, the, and strokes are the real thing. You know, it's, it's, yeah. You can say it's the moment like I accepted my mortality and I chose, no, I want to live. I want to see my kids grow up. So one thing to help it was no longer drinking alcohol. At that point, I was already running. I, was already, I had already changed my lifestyle in that way. But uh, the no drinking alcohol is one that I'm not even tempted by it. Uh, you know, I have, I'm not even tempted at all because I know that I haven't healed my, my sleep apnea. Even with a device, I haven't healed it, you know, and it's the consequence is not worth the effort. Like my friend Kirk would say, the juice is not worth the squeeze. Yeah. Oh. Oh, well, I'm glad you discovered that uh, and cut that out of your life before it had serious consequences. Mm-hmm. So good for you. I'm going to insert a question 6A. <laughs> so 6A, what has been your favorite marathon or what's been one that you've just enjoyed a lot of the six you've run? You say six. 18 half marathons? I've ran five uh, California international marathons, which is from Folsom to Sacramento. And I've ran one San Diego marathon, which is uh, around San Diego. The rest of them are half marathons all over the place. So it'll be my very favorite marathon has to be my second one. And the reason why is that I finished it. I finished all of them. But that one, I had around mile 18, I started having some issues with my hip flexor. And at mile 20, I felt like an electric shock going up and down from my pelvis, down to my foot, up to my brain going, wow, what the? 
And all of a sudden, I, run, I lost my ability to run, my, my running stride. Wow. And I had six more miles left. So at that moment, I, I, it was okay. You know, if I wanted to stop, I could stop. But I could walk. And I could walk without pain mm. at that moment. <laughs> so I decided to walk. And as I'm walking, because at that moment, I just I, I, I accepted the truth. I'm not going to finish at the time I was going to finish or whatever image I had, I let go of it. I completely surrendered to the truth of my situation, but I still wanted to finish. Mm -hmm. So I adapted to my truth and I kept walking. The bus and the truck would, all, you know, would drive by, open the door, inviting me to get in. And I'm like, Oh, thank you. I appreciate it, but I'm going to follow. So by the end of it, I was, it was painful, but I finished it. And I crossed another threshold. My, my self-doubt told me I couldn't cross. I didn't hurt myself in the sense that I wasn't really, really injuring myself more in this because I wasn't using that muscle anymore. I wasn't using that. I, I was using the hip flexor, mm -hmm. but I was using different muscles to overcompensate that. When I crossed the line, I had the biggest smile. It was just such a rewarding feeling that it's my favorite since then i've ran mar uh, other marathons and i've some of them i finished running you know some of them i, I had a hard time but i still finished that one though it is the one that like i knew i had i have faith faith in myself to be able to do it and i did it you know it's like knowing what it feels like to dig deep down yeah to get, to get something done That's and awesome. you know i let go it like yeah it's like so for me that was a, a big lesson that here's the thing i i, I apply it with everything i got I, I that lesson from that day i carry it from writing books to giving lectures to being on tour to being a parent of an autistic boy of a teenage girl of going through this whole COVID thing is it's, it's 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 the thing that I I translate things. So it's like if that lesson I can apply it in my running, I can physically apply everything everywhere else. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, I've run half marathons that were spectacular, a lot of fun, a lot of great moments in life. That one is the one that fuels all those runs. That's awesome. You know, you have that one moment that just gives power to all of them, knowing I can do this and. I've also, I have one that one, I've run that one race where I stopped because, okay, I'm, I, I'm hurting my, my ankle. If I keep pushing it, what's, what do I want? I want to run again. Okay. You got to stop running right now, accept that bus and all right. You know, I've done that. Yeah. But that day, that day I got to know what digging deep, sorry, my accent got in the way, digging deep means, mm -hmm. and it's not a concept it's something I can tap into. Yeah. And that, that to me is such a beautiful example of what we were talking about a few minutes ago about goals, about yeah. the value is then what you become, what you learn and experience in the process. And now you apply that as yeah. you said. In so exactly. many and, and I had to let go of the goal. I had to let go. You know, I was like, it, it wasn't the motivator and I wasn't calling, call myself a quitter, whatever. It, it's like, I had to accept my truth at the moment and adapt and ask myself, what do I want? I want to cross that line. Okay, what do I need to do that? And I accepted the truth and I adapted. Mm. And being, it's called being flexible. Life, if you want to, my grandma used to say, if you want to make God laugh, tell her your plans. <laughs> you, know, you adapt. It's about being flexible. You know, this, this, uh, this situation, we're all living all across the world. You know, a year ago, we adapt. At first, it was difficult, but eventually we found that rhythm. And yeah. once we found that rhythm, we keep following. You know, it's like yeah. to do social distance learning with an autistic son is difficult. You yeah. know, to help my daughter go through the emotional turmoil of not being around her friends has also been difficult. So we had different things they had to adapt and you let go of it. And I'm not working anymore. So at that point, I stopped touring because I, was, I can't really go anywhere. But my per it was perfect because my priority was with my family. Yeah. You adapt. You 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 become flexible, and you ask yourself, "What do I want to accomplish in this situation?" And that is the thing. And the number one rule I had during the whole COVID thing, especially those first six months, is 
every time I woke up, get dressed. Don't stay in your pajamas, get dressed. Yeah. It was an action, uh, setting the intent. It's not a vacation. We're going to work through this. Yep. And it came from that moment, you know, that moment in that, that race. That's great. Okay. Last few questions in the lightning round. Question number seven. What's one thing you wish every American knew? Compassion. Yeah, me too. Question number eight. What is the most important or useful thing you've ever learned about making relationships work? In my lessons, I teach about I only control to the tips of my fingers. I don't control beyond that. And every relationship exists because people say yes to one another. So you can say is the free will of two individuals who say yes to one another. And they are completely free to change their mind at any given moment. So about relationships, that's it. You know, um, my stepmom asked my wife, my, my stepmom, she, may she rest in peace, asked my wife, how did you guys survive the culture clash between you? each other. You know, my wife, like I said before, she grew up in Harriman, Utah, and I grew up in San Diego, California. And my wife answered a very beautiful way. She said, because we love each other. When couples come and ask me for advice, I always ask the same question. Do you guys want to stay together? If they both say yes, the rest is easy because that mutual yes is the motivator that allows you to get through all these hurdles. If they both say no, that's also easy because they're both saying the truth. It's complicated when one says yes and the other one says no. At that moment, you're trying to change someone else's mind, and that gets, always gets complicated. Yeah. But it's that mutual yes for one another, that mutual respect for one another that allows us to enjoy the relationship. Mm-hmm. So respect. <laughs> A long way to get to that, that answer. That's great. Well, I know we're about we're at the time that we had agreed we would talk. Um, I have just, I think three more questions. I think. I can, yeah. I can stick around. Okay. All right. So the last one here in the enlightening lightning round is about money. Mm-hmm. And it's this aside from compound interest, what's the most important or useful thing you've ever learned about money or what's something you're always sure to do with it or you never do with it. Oh, the biggest thing I've ever learned about money is that knowing the difference between an asset and a liability. A, li- a liability takes money out of your pocket. An asset brings money into put it into it. If you, if, you, if you know the difference between the two, everything is easy. What were the specific assets or asset and liability that taught you this lesson? Well, Obviously, it's a, I'm referring to, uh, there's a book called Rich Dad Poor Dad that uh, Robert Kiyosaki that I read yep. when I was very young, yep. when it came out. But that main idea that an asset brings money to you and a liability takes money out of you is like you, you realize that a liability is something that, you, that takes energy out of you. Mm-hmm. An asset is something that brings energy to you. If you look at money in that, in that regards, and like it's been said before, and it's a cliche, I know, mon- money is energy. And that's because it's a symbol that represents a shared value. You know, before money, uh, trade was, you, you, can't, you, you wouldn't know if it was of the same value. You know, it gives you, allows, allows you to understand that this is worth the same or much, you know, that, in that regards, what is fair trade. So money represents a symbol that represents something, an, an agreement between these two people or main, uh, society, this is how much it's worth. And of course, with inflation and every cha- everything changes. But something that is true with whether money is money or whatever is something that brings things to you mm-hmm. and things that take things out of you. In regards to money, what do you create that brings money to you in form of work, um, investment, or passive income? 
or those things. And what is it that, that takes money out of you in the sense that you have to work really hard in order to pay for that. And hopefully you're not overspending and going beyond your means. When I learned that lesson, it's all about learning how that balance is because my father talks about finding all the energy leaks in you. What if you learn, if you're able to let go of the leaks in your life, you have more energy for yourself. And that's a, a, that's a spiritual concept there. It's like, look for the leaks. It's, if, you, if you translate that to money, look at all the things that take money out of you. And basically that's all the effort that is taken out of you, that you have to really work in order to get that back. Whereas an asset, something that reduces your effort, but is still able to bring you money. It's like, all right. In the sense of, you know, what we know in this uh, capitalist society, uh, a liabil- uh, uh, an asset is something uh, like a rent, mm-hmm. something that gives you royalties, something that gives you uh, investment c- uh, capital. Uh, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for in re- uh, regards? Um, in- income? In- income, yeah, income. Yeah. And some, and uh, uh, um, a liability is something that takes your income away. It's like, for example, today we get we get paid, and all of a sudden the money goes away because as soon as you got it, you have to pay for everything that you have, and all of a sudden just like it went, came in, there it went. All right, <laughs> yep. that's that's how that energy flowed. Yeah. All right. How can I balance that? How, how can I balance how what I give energy to and what brings energy to me? And if we can find that. In finances, we can also find that in our personal life, you know, with drama, with gossip, with love and compassion. Compassion and love brings energy to you. Gossip and, and all that stuff, is take, it drains you. You know, you, you're, whenever you sit down with someone who's gossiping all the time and just dumping all this stuff on you, at the, by the end of that conversation, you're drained of energy. It's, it's, it's a lot. Yeah. But then if you're talking to someone who's inspiring you, all of a sudden, like, you, it might be the same amount of time, but instead of being drained, you feel energized because this person just gave you all this inspiration. Uh, there it is, you know? Yeah. So it's, 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 it's the same thing with finances, with money. Yeah. You know, our, our negative relation, relationship with money, we're projecting onto it the behavior of individuals. Uh, and it has nothing to do with money but it's a projection we have, you know, greed and selfishness. It's more of the characteristics of that where abundance and generosity, you know? So it reminds me of what my father says, love is the perfect balance between gratitude and generosity. Mm. I like that. I've heard a lot of definitions of love, but never that one. I like that. Yeah. My, that's all my dad. That's my, my dad's. That's the one he uses. Mm-hmm. It's okay. And generosity and gratitude. So the last part of the, the interview here is, is about writing in a creative process. And I know we could, we could do an hour and a half on this alone. And of course <laughs> they, we won't. Yeah. Um, but just want to, I want to ask you this question about, I definitely want to ask you about your advice and encouragement for those who are working to get their own books done. So I'd love if you just give a few words to those listening who find themselves in that situation. But I also wonder if you'd be willing to share a little insight into how, how you get your books done. I know there's not a secret. I know it's a lot of hard work. No, oh, yeah, it's a, yeah it's, a marath- it's a marathon. <laughs> yeah. So, so I, I guess I would just say, what's the thumbnail? Like, how do you do it? Having done it five times, you're in the midst of writing your sixth now. Mm-hmm. How do you do it? And then what advice and encouragement do you you leave those listening with. Okay, I'll, I'll start with a quote from a movie, Finding Forrester. You write with your heart, you edit with the mind. Mm-hmm. I love that line and that phrase, that quote, because it's the truth. The first draft that you write is a purge. It's not pretty. It's not grammatically correct. It's you purging all these ideas. And the reason why you're able to purge is because the audience is you. It's me. So you write with the heart and you let it, it's like throwing up. And, like, and the thing about it is that we have to learn not to edit as we're purging. Being able to trust in ourselves to let it all out, let it all out. 
which, which by the way, was much easier for us because we read your books and we broke up with our inner critic and our inner judge. (laughs) Thank you. There you go. (laughs) Thank you so much for that. (laughs) Well, but it's true because when I first started writing, it would take me two or three hours to write a paragraph. And the reason why is because it needs to be pristine. It needs to be perfect. Darn new Jack Kerouac for writing a manuscript without any editing on the road, on the road. Yeah. And, and by the way, that, yeah. lot of, huh? I was just going to j- j- jump in for a minute and just h- put a point on what you said about literally three hours for one paragraph. Like that's not, that's not hyperbole. That's not an exaggeration. So for people who are listening, who are serious about this, realizing those who do it, who've written five, six books have gone through this journey and maybe sometimes still do where there are hours on one block of text on 300 words. Yeah, and the reason is because we want it to be perfect from the get-go, and it takes a long time to be able to develop the trust of being terrible and let it all out. Let it all out because you're trying to create a clay. You're trying to create the clay by which you're molding. So get yourself out of the way. Don't edit as you write. Let it all out. Let it all out. Let it all out. It's Like I said before, it's like purging. It's like throwing up. Mm-hmm. And once you have all that done, you can write several, several pages without a paragraph, without a a period, without a coma, without anything. Just learn to let it all out. Hit save, walk away. Come back later or in a day or two or a week or however long. Select all, copy, open up a new file, paste, hit save, put away the other one and never touch it again. It's your master. In this one, you start putting in grammatical rules, periods, commas, and all that stuff. Hit save, walk away. Come back. Now this is where editing with the mind comes in. The reason why you edit with the mind is because all of a sudden you're, the reader has changed. In the first manuscript, you are the reader. When you're the reader, you can have gaping holes and all those things because you're the one filling in the holes. When you start editing, the reader changes. It's going to be your reader, the people out there. You're basically editing in a form of you're translating it into a language someone else can understand. And the book has to stand on its own. It doesn't, like, the author doesn't have, the reader doesn't have you to ask the question, what do you mean here, what do you mean there, what do you mean there, you know, unless you have an, you're in an interview. But the book has to stand on its own. So you begin to edit. The, on my first book, The Five Levels of Attachment, I wrote five manuscripts. And I used two different editors to help me with that one. There was three editors. The final, Like, Randy Davila, my, my publisher, he's the main editor of all my books. He's like, he's the final say. It's like, it's, it's a, uh, Janet Mills is to my father. Uh, Randy Davila is to mine. Uh, Christy Macris is my editor that helps me put in the rules of grammar to that clay, that, that purge. And we work, begin to work on between she and I, you know, we, we put it into thing. Once she and I finish, we go with uh, Randy and he starts putting in the edit. So, uh, Christy knows me and, Randy knows the audience. All right. But if you don't have the luxury of having an editor, you still have to translate, trans, transcribe or translate it into a language that someone else can understand. So that's what I mean by you write with your heart, you edit with the mind. When you write with the heart, let it all out. Learn to just let it all out. And you want as much as you want. For example, in the, in the, in the mass... In the mastery of self, I wrote about. Actually, no, I'm going to go here. I'm, the, the current book I just I'm writing right now, I turned in eighty thousand words in the first manuscript, the first the first purge, and I cut it down to about sixty, then down to forty five. And once you're in forty five, now you're in, in, in editing mode of like, all right, now we're we now, now we're somewhere. You know, if you get down to thirty, you're you're really really good. Then you begin to, then what you add is you're filling in the holes and then it, it grows. Uh, 
patience is important. There's that phrase, as someone saying, if you write 500 words a day, by the end of the year, you have a novel. And that's very true, and, it's, and it's, that's very important. But editing is some, it's, it's a gift. So you have to learn how to keep the line. You have like this line that keeps it all together. Now, the most important part of a book, an idea. Mind you, the reader starts from beginning to end. The author does not. The author is free to start wherever the author wants to start. He or she can start wherever there's a thought. And the image I have is, well, there's two. Um, oh, man, I just forgot her name. Um, J.K. Rowling, Harry Potter series. Now, this is I'm going off memory here from what I read from an interview. So I might, I might, my memory might be off, but I'll say it this way. Her, her very first thought, the very first image on the Harry Potter series was that of a giant walking out of a forest with a body of a boy in his arms. That's the very first image she had. If you read the series, you know that's the last book. That's, that's, that's at the end of a seven big, big books. It's a more than a million words, by the way. Yeah, I read it to my daughters during the pandemic. I think it's a million seventy four thousand wow. words. Congratulations, man. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> how's your voice? How's your voice? Does it hurt? <laughs> <laughs> it's good. It's all good. It was fun. Good. So so you know exactly how far in is that image of a giant walking out of a forest with a boy. Yeah. Which means the whole world was answering questions, which who is this giant? Who is this boy? What are they doing? Why are they coming out? Why this, this? It has that image. And she began to ask the question, who is this? What is this? What? And all that, that's all it is. It's like answering who. So she creates this whole backstory to how the, these two people got there. Yep. And from that series of questions arise a very rich, very beautifully detailed world. And then the resolution comes no longer after that. You know, it's like it's 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 uh, it comes really quickly after that. It's, it's not that far after, you know, the Battle of Hogwarts part two, whatever. Yeah. But it's really that you have a moment. Now in Mamma Mia, you know, if you if you my my my, my family loves Mamma Mia, the, the, the movie, the, the musical. The author of that play, because that's what it was originally, a, a, a musical on Broadway, whatever. The image this author had was of the mother singing The Winner Takes It All to the gentleman. And the movie is Meryl Streep singing The Winner Takes It All to James Bond. That's the very first image. And once again, it's an image, a scene that's at the very end. Who is this? What is this? It's all backstory. So character development, asking the question, how did you get here? Why, who, where, when? You're basically a reporter. You're, you're, you're filling in the gaps with questions. Why is this? Why is that? And also it turns out that all this writing really is those moments, this epiphany, questions that you answer that takes you outside of this comfort zone of what you know and what is. You know, anxiety is answering the what ifs with the worst case scenario emotionally. Same thing with a lot of things, you know, you can also put in the best case scenario and make you happy, you know, and it's in the opposite direction as well. Who is this? Why is that? Who is this giant? His name is Hagrid. Who is this boy? His name is Harry Potter. Why would a giant walk out with a boy? Well, he's some wizard and, and this and this and that. And you can, the whole thing, and, like, and there's a reason why, you know, like uh, the, uh, Alan Rickman, I think that's his name, uh, who played Snape. You know, he, he didn't want to, uh, at first he was like, I'm not sure I'm going to do this. I'm, I, don't, I don't know if I'm going to do this part. And then Jake and Roland says, come here, let me, let me. So they go into the room. There she tells the arc of Snape and the line, even still. And he says, always. Rickman says, that's it, that, that part, always. 
got them, which means as an author, she already knew the arc. She yeah. knew the whole thing. And when that happened, that book wasn't even published yet. You know, when the first movie for the first a uh, Sorcerer's Stone or the, 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 yeah, the, the yeah, that's our sort of stone. That's the first one. I was I was thinking what the English version of it was. Yeah, in England, it was the Philosopher's Stone. The Philosopher's Stone, yeah, the Philosopher's Stone, the uh, Sorcerer's Stone. When that movie came out, we were still in like, book three or four. You know, like we were uh, the Goblet of Fire or or, or the Prison of Askaman had just come out. Like like uh, the uh, the Deathly Hollows were years away from that. You know, so um, it's you. You start writing at your first question or the first mark, the first image. In my case, you know, with uh, with the five levels of attachment, it was the moment. It was uh, the image of Don Quixote uh, looking at windmills and telling Don Quixote, uh, Sancho Panza, saying, "Don Quixote, Don Quixote, are you okay? What's the matter with you? Those are giants. They're windmills." And Don Quixote saying to him, ah, Sancho, how naive you are. It was my arch nemesis, the magician, who turned these giants into windmills just to make me look bad. <laughs> that image is what allowed me to put into perspective the five levels of attachment, and I began to write. That was the image. Mm. And the mastery itself, it's basically letting go of the identity and going into preference and how we take off the mask of our identity that slippery slope by which we domesticate ourselves or honor our past and our preferences. This identity is a beautiful thing. That's the image. In the seven secrets of happy, healthy relationships, secret number four, um, healing. Is, it, that was the image, you know, the, the story I told you about my ex or my first love. Yep. In this one, it is the image of a, the new one it's the image of a, a seraphim who is, becomes aware of that is the voice of God. When a human see, hears the voice of God, he's actually not hearing the voice of God because if a human were to ever hear the voice of God, the human would explode, it would get destroyed, which means God speaks through a seraphim that talks at the level of humanity. That is the image I have in describing what I'm talking about, the, 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 the mind, you know, the, in the four agreements, my father calls it the parasite, the, that to me, which is to me, the judge and the victim, the, uh, the active domesticator in our life. It is the redemption of the mind. How does the serf and, and uh, how does this little demon called the parasite find redemption to become a channel of unconditional love, which is the angel that fell that becomes the ally. Redemption song, emancipate yourself from mental slavery, none but ourselves can free our mind, which is of course the master yourself as well, but it's also here as well. You have this image and you begin to roll it out. Beautiful. And uh, I imagine those who are listening who have an aspiration to write can see something for themselves. Hopefully they're recognizing, you know, what that kernel is or what the genesis of this idea is and can use it to guide them and follow what you've said about just write from the heart, edit with the head later. But uh, and, I, and I can tell you what I told my nephews and my nieces because I've gotten uh, my, my nephews and nieces have asked me similar questions on how to write a book and my nieces who, who how to become a, an artist. I told them, you really want my help? Said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I want my help. Like, Are you sure? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, there's one thing I need you to do first. Accept this truth. You're never going to get published. They're like, what? Repeat after me. I'm never going to get published, but, 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 repeat after me. I'm never going to get published, but, but, Tio, Tio, Uncle, Uncle, Tio. Look in my eyes and accept this truth. I'm never going to get published. And eventually they relent and they say, fine. I'm never going to get published. Good. 
now that you accepted it, why are you still doing it? Because I want to. And there it is. That's why you do it. Let go of the image that one day you're going to get published. Let go of the image that you're going to be a New York Times bestseller or a, a, a best-selling author or a, a, a musician with great accolades and multiple albums sold with sold-out arenas. Let go of that. Once you let go, why are you still doing it? Because I love to. That is the motivator why you do it. Success is going to be unique to you. It's going to be different for everyone. But if you're doing it because you love to do it, you're already succeeding, even if you play to a bar or a small club or have just a few readers. You did it because you wanted to, not because you had to. Yeah. Awesome. What a wonderful way to, to conclude. Thank you for that, for that insight. Miguel, if people want to connect with you, or they want to learn for, they want to learn more from you. What would you have them do? Well, there's a website. Uh, I have a www.miguelruizjr.com, miguelruizjr.com, or my father's miguelruiz.com. That's more like the family. You'll find my father and my brother and myself there. We're we're active nowadays, but you know everything changes just like it is. So I always say the website is our home base. But uh, yeah, awesome. That's great. And um, one thing that I've done as an expression of gratitude to you for making time to share so generously of your experience and your wisdom with me and everyone listening is I've gone online to kiva.org, the micro lending site, and I've made a hundred dollar micro loan to an entrepreneur who is in El Salvador. She's a single mother. She sells food, but she's also a farmer. So she's going to use this money to lease, uh, some land and buy some farming supplies where she'll grow and sell corn. So thank you for giving me a, uh, a reason to go and make that loan. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you so much for doing that. I'm, I really am grateful for you to help so many in that way. Hey, thanks so much for listening to this episode of the School for Good Living podcast. Before you take off, I just want to extend an invitation to you. Despite living in an age where we have more comforts and conveniences than ever before, life still isn't working for many people. Whether it's here in the developed world where we deal with depression, anxiety, loneliness, addiction, divorce, unfulfilling jobs or relationships that don't work, or in the developing world where so many people still don't have access to basic things like clean water or sanitation or healthcare or education, or they live in conflict zones, there are a lot of people on this planet that life isn't working very well for. If you're one of those people, or even if your life is working, but you have the sense that it could work better, consider signing up for the School for Good Living's Transformational Coaching Program. It's something I've designed to help you navigate the transitions that we all go through. Whether you've just graduated, or you've gone through a divorce, or you've gotten married, headed into retirement, starting a business, been married for a long time, whatever. No matter where you are in life, this nine-month program will give you the opportunity to go deep in every area of your life, to explore life's big questions, to create answers for yourself in a community of other growth-minded individuals. And it can help you get clarity and be accountable to realize more of your unrealized potential. It can also help you find and maintain motivation. In short, it's designed to help you live with greater health, happiness, and meaning so that you can be, do, have, and give more. Visit goodliving.com to learn more or to sign up today.